Okay, so now we go on with our uh, next talk, which is on uh, Spring Framework 5, Things and Trends, by Jürgen Holder. Yeah, testing the, yeah, the audio works. Great. Uh, well, very quick turnover from the previous session. I hope you don't mind. Um, welcome from my side. Uh, the, um, um, the purpose of this talk is a bit more strategic than, uh, uh, than some of the other Spring Talks you might have uh, uh, seen uh, elsewhere. I've uh, named this talk Themes and Trends, Spring from Mac 5 Themes and Trends, because we uh, are in the process of uh, releasing Spring from Mac 5.0. We are now at uh, milestone 5. We are uh, soon to, to enter the release candidate phase in, uh, in April. And uh, the Spring from Mac 5 release, like any major Spring release, is very much driven by, well, certain themes and trends. So. Spring doesn't live in an island. It never did, right? Uh, Spring is very much in, uh, uh, a, a framework uh, establishing itself, re-establishing, constantly re-establishing itself in the wider ecosystem out there, in the industry out there, and uh, picking up industry trends um, at, uh, well, uh, yeah, an ideal time idea, right? A good enough time. The uh, um, motivation in Spring Framework 5 is... Uh, of course, to uh, pick up the latest generation of the JDK, uh, the latest uh, uh, generation of uh, several other specifications in the Java ecosystem, and general industry trends, I would argue, uh, reactive programming and functional composition styles. So before we, we dive into the, the actual uh, um, themes, uh, let's quickly recap the state of the art, uh, very briefly. This is where we are right now. Spring Framework 4.3 is our production release, uh, already out for, uh, well, uh, almost uh, um, soon to be a year, basically. We started the release candidate phase a year ago, uh, and it's GA since early June last year. Uh, 4.3 basically is uh, evolving into the same role that Spring Framework 3.2 had for several years. It's going to have an extended maintenance life. It's the last 4.x feature release. There won't be a 4.4. Actually, we weren't even sure whether there, there would be a 4.3. We decided on the 4.3 rather late. And this already brings us to today's topic. 4.3 is intentionally uh, a kind of pairing with 5.0. Um, to some degree, 4.3 is a sort of early backboard of features which otherwise would only have ended up in 5.0. The idea is that we brought those things not only forward to 2016, I mean, they're already available, um, we all, uh, not, so we, not just timing-wise, we brought them forward, we also brought them into the Spring Framework 4 system requirements. Anything that we did in 4.3, in particular the refinements to the, to the annotation-based component model, um, you can essentially run on, on well, JDK 6, 7, 8, on uh, even a Server 2.5 container, if you insist. The, uh, um, the motivation to do so um, seems to have turned out well, because we are always very numbers driven. We uh, evaluate the download statistics on Maven Central. This is the past year. The Spring Core downloads from Maven Central, the Spring Core artifact as a reference point for typical Spring framework usage. Um, not a bad trend. Um, I'm not sure where that trend is going, actually. I mean, it's like through the roof. Uh, but the, uh, I'm not sure where that rise comes from. Uh, we are, like with any statistics, uh, uh, only taking the, uh, the indications as they come. We actually don't know how they come about, right? Um, but for the three is a really important release. Um, uh, what we're not seeing here is that in parallel to the Spring from the 3 release, we did a Spring Boot 1.4, a Spring Boot 1.5, picking up the latest Spring from the 3 releases, corresponding Spring Cloud releases, Spring is the, uh, the Spring framework is the foundation for an entire ecosystem, and uh, the uh, indications for Spring framework usage translate very much to the ecosystem, um, and are driven by the ecosystem by by Spring Boot usage in particular these days. So, uh, in all applicable brevity, uh, just a few uh, isolated spots. This is a general component class in Spring. shouldn't shouldn't look uh, out of the ordinary, but the commented out auto wired constructor is a hint at 4.3. As of Spring Framework 4.3, you don't have to declare uh, a constructor as auto-wired if there is only one which is clearly designed for dependency injection purposes. 
So uh, that's a nice refinement in general. Um, it's actually particularly nice if a class otherwise doesn't have any annotations on it. So here, here you, you, we can see other annotations, but in a class just doing dependency injection, a little delegate component being registered with the container, it's quite nice to design them, even in the annotation-based model in general, to design them without the need for annotations. For um, documentation purposes, for self description purposes. I nevertheless recommend to annotate it, actually. Uh, but this is one of the refinements we did in Photo 3. On a related note, and just indicating where we take refinements to, a configuration class like this didn't actually work, uh, like this very specific one, didn't actually work pre Photo 3. This configuration class, defining admin methods, actually has a constructor of its own, a custom constructor a constructor asking for dependency injection, storing the data source in the field and picking it up from the admin method again. This didn't actually work because uh, configuration classes are subclassed at runtime through CGLib and uh, it took special effort on our end to make the, uh, the overriding work here that, to recreate a, a subclass variant of that constructor. So. Uh, this is a refinement um, that really makes sense from a consistency perspective. Anything you can do to a regular component class in the Spring Component Model, you should be able to apply to a configuration class because configuration classes are just regular component classes with a special purpose. Uh, otherwise, they have the same kind of life cycle, the same kind of injection management as any other component type in the Spring Container. And of course, along with the previous refinement, you can have a custom constructor accepting other references, and you do not even have to annotate it. You can annotate it with add auto wired, but you don't have to, like with a regular component class in Photo 3. Another refinement, this is already uh, all I mean to, to show from Photo 3, there's, there's a lot more. Just, uh, just really those two areas. This is a Spring MVC controller of the more traditional kind, like Photo 2 level. In Photo 3, we introduced variants of the mapping annotations uh, called get ma mapping, post mapping, put mapping, patch mapping, and delete mapping as an alternative to request mapping. So if you compare those directly, you see the brevity. There is a little bit of sweetness in there uh, to, to be found in there. In Java, in Java 5's annotation design, if an annotation only accepts a single attribute, you can def uh, declare it such that the attribute's name is value, and you don't have to name the attribute here. So there's no need to say like value or path equals books ID. This is pr the primary benefit of baking the HTTP method into the actual name of the annotation so that the typical specification of attributes is reduced to just the path. You can still add consumes and produces clauses, but uh, uh, in these simple, straightforward cases, uh, there is a really nice shortcutting and, and actually readability improvement uh, coming here. This is a fine example of what, what, or what we call uh, composable annotations, a uh, general Spring Framework 4 theme. Um, you can build custom annotations, meta annotated with standard Spring annotations, uh, expressing your particular need in a, a type of your own. Essentially, get mapping and post mapping and co are just composable annotations. You can build such shortcut annotations yourselves, no problem whatsoever. We just decided to ship them out of the box based on the very same generic mechanism, decided to ship them out of the box because this has been a common requirement and it's actually nicely aligned with other endpoint annotations in Spring. Like for the Stomp protocol on a WebSocket channel, we have message mapping and subscribe mapping annotations, particularly purposed mapping annotations. We have equivalents here now in Spring MVC. So this is a Folder 3 um, introduction. The, uh, you, get the, you get the point, right? The uh, Folder 3 feature set here could have been a 5.0 in, in quite a few perspectives in other projects maybe. It would only have materialized in a new uh, major revision, but we decided to sneak them into Photo 3 because they are very straightforward from a technical perspective and they are really nice refinements to a central Spring Framework 4 theme, which is the annotation-based component model and composable annotations in particular. Now, in Spring Framework 5, we're taking a different perspective. Spring Framework 5 is a, um, not only an opportunity to raise the baseline to like Java 8+, plus, 
and essentially to a Java E7 uh, oriented baseline, like serv requiring server 3.1, JPA 2.1, and co. This is a, 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 a particularly important part, of course, of of what we are doing. We're cleaning up the code base. We can use uh, JDK 8, uh, Java 8 API, and uh, Java 8 language features inside our production code base for the first time. I mean, this is great, right? But for us, right? Not necessarily for uh, application development, because for application development, we've already supported your efforts to use JDK 8 and uh, Java 8 uh, uh, API types. We've already supported everything from functional interfaces uh, down to the java.time types to optional signatures to complete little future signatures. We were already reacting to your use of Java 8 features. We just could not use it internally. But if you're a Java 8 user, you've already been able to do almost everything that we typically want to enable on, on Spring Framework 4.3. So 5 is really more of an internal JDK 8 upgrade. Um, an important foundation for the years to come for us. It does have the benefit that we can expose certain Java 8 API types in our static interfaces, static interface signatures now. We can have uh, methods on, for example, generic application context accepting suppliers, Java Util function suppliers, a JDK 8 introduced type. We couldn't uh, do this before. We could only reflectively support such JDK 8 types. So, uh, so much for the baseline upgrade. There's, there's more. We have JUnit 5 support, uh, um, but uh, um, the, uh, the uh, focus of Spring Framework 5 is very much driven by infrastructure themes. And this is already forward looking, right? It's JDK 9, it's uh, the uh, evolving servlet for the DOS specification. Uh, actually, more importantly, it's a uh, requirement for HTTP 2. It's a new language that we're embracing as an alternative language for application development in Spring in the form of Kotlin. Spring Framework 4 had a strong focus on not only on Java 8 in application code, but also on uh, Groovy. And uh, an equally first-class treatment you can expect uh, for Kotlin here in Spring Framework 5. And it's about the functional and reactive themes that I've been hinting at before. So uh, a few, just a few little further insights into the main themes. Let's start with JDK 9. JDK 9 is coming up very soon now. Um, I mean, let's hope it's actually happening at the end of July. There are no guarantees in the software space, and there are no guarantees with JDK 9 in particular if you followed its, the, the evolution of its roadmap. Uh, but let's assume it's happening at the end of July. It's already in the ramp down phase. Um, so we have a very stable um, environment to, to, to test against. We've already been tracking JDK 9 for one and a half years. So in Spring Framework land, even Spring Framework 4.3 is uh, entirely compatible with JDK 9 uh, to the best possible degree at this point. Um, there's just very minor glitches in third-party libraries, but we're even testing those in integration. So JDK 9 in general is always about the module system, about Jigsaw, right? So let's, let me invert this. Uh, bring the most important part first. JDK 9 is not just about the module system. JDK 9 has a lot of goodness, a lot of refinements, both in the runtime infrastructure and to some degree also for, from the development experience perspective, um, that are worth embracing. Let's upgrade to JDK 9. Let's plan our upgrades to JDK 9. Holding on to JDK 8 forever is not an option. The easiest upgrade path is on the class path, right? Take an existing Java 8 based ap Spring application, move it to JDK 9, just start it there. Don't even recompile it, right? Compile it with target 1.8 and run it on JDK 9. And you're going to get quite, some quite nice transparent benefits. You can benefit from the compact strings representation at runtime, from the garbage collection improvements, from the simplified stack setup for web applications. Uh, you can use JShell if you want. You can use the collection factory methods if you're upgrading to the Java 9 source code level. All of those things work very nicely with existing modern uh, frameworks and libraries, the latest versions ideally, um, without having to even touch the module system much at all. Stay on the class path and the upgrade is truly smooth. For the purposes of Jigsaw, 
the way that we are approaching this is we want to enable applications to opt into the module system. So you may choose to use Jigsaw. You may choose to deploy your stack, your deployment arrangement, on the module path instead of the class path on JDK 9. Bringing our standard Spring Framework chars from Event Central onto the module path is already supported. It even works with 4.3. The uh, idea is that on the module path, they are being treated as what JDK 9 calls automatic modules. So each of the uh, jar files is kind of turned into a module, the module name derived from the jar file name based on some conventions. Making those modules, those Spring Framework chars, um, well, accessible from uh, the module system perspective. So in an application, you can implement uh, a, a module, uh, you can add a module descriptor. Um, this is a module info Java file that in, the, in Jigsaw will be compiled by the JDK9 compiler to a class file to be included in your, in your application chars. And uh, a Spring Framework modules like the Spring JDBC module can be referred to through a naming convention implementing implemented in automatic modules. It's basically the jar name without a version and with uh, um, dots as a separator. So just by convention, without the framework actually shipping module descriptors itself, it is usable in, an, in a Jigsaw-based application arrangement. And this is the only thing that really matters. We want to enable application projects to embrace Jigsaw if they choose to do so. So currently we're trying to have this balanced perspective, usability on the class path first on JDK 9, uh, usability on the module path if applications choose to use it. This comes at a price. This is worth a talk of its own, right? So let's wrap it up here. But Jigsaw isn't, is, isn't a, uh, as smooth an upgrade as, uh, as the class path, of course, on JDK 9. You have to live with its limited exposure, its visibility, its enforced visibility restrictions between module boundaries. Um, all of those things may be worth embracing or maybe not in your particular scenario. This is up to you to decide. All right, uh, well, so much for Jigsaw. Uh, the JDK 9 story on our end is as complete as we currently wanted to have. We're going to release uh, in the current plan, Spring Framework 5.0, uh, RC1 in April already, uh, with a GA timeframe of around June. So ahead of JDK 9, uh, at least a month or two, maybe two ahead of JDK 9. The uh, um, arrangement is tested against the latest JDK 9 uh, candidate uh, builds, so uh, we are confident that by the time JDK 9 goes out, you can keep using um, the spring, uh, latest Spring Framework versions and just switch your JDK to JDK 9 and all will be good out of the box. So we're trying to be forward compatible with JDK 9, a little bit ahead of, its, of JDK, 9's own, uh, JDK 9's own JDK uh, uh, GA release, its own general availability. All right, so much for for JDK 9 for a start. HTTP 2, um, again, let's not uh, dive too deep into, the, in, into it, but G HTTP 2 is probably the most important industry initiative that we, we, we have, that we currently have in this, uh, in this infrastructure ecosystem. It's the first revision of the HTTP specification in about 20 years. Um, we really need to get our act together and embrace it. So with all the, all, all the benefits, I mean, they are listed here, right? Uh, uh, there are so many efficiency benefits in HTTP 2 that even if you're not actually restructuring your HTTP interaction logic or your resource arrangement, if you're just transparently upgrading, like with JDK 9, right? Take an existing web application, uh, reconfigure the server container to use HTTP 2, Make sure that the proxies and everything else around you is also HTTP2 capable. And there are going to be transparent benefits in the usage of your application, in, the, in efficient access to your application, in efficient use of server resources in your server systems without having even to touch your application's code. I mean, it doesn't get better than that, right? The uh, browsers and many other HTTP, HTTP stakeholders already did their job we are lagging behind a little in the server container space. And this is a, somewhat of a, a bit of a typical Java syndrome. Everybody's waiting for a new specification revision to do the job, right, for us. 
There is no need to wait for Servlet 4.0. I mean, Servlet 4.0 is great. It's great that they require HTTP2 finally. It's great that they even support HTTP2 pushes, probably the least important HTTP2 feature, but anyway, right? The, uh, it's great that they are doing this, that they are going there, but Servlet 4.0 is, is not expected before July. Only as of very recently, it's even targeting July now. Previously, it was targeting uh, Q4 this year. So Servlet 4.0 is fine as an effort, but it's not actually necessary because HTTP2 doesn't leak through the Servlet API much at all. The only API feature in Servlet 4 that is HTTP2 related is the push builder. If you're not using HTTP2 pushes, Servlet 3.1 is all you'll ever need. I mean, of course, once Servlet 4 is out, once Tomcat 9 goes GA, by all means consider an upgrade to it. But for the time being, consider using the latest, Tomcat 8.5, JD 9.4, Undertow 1.4. They all did their job already. There are ways of setting them up with an HTTP2 ready protocol stack, even on JDK 8. It's not as smooth as it should be, but it is entirely possible right now. It's going to be significantly better on JDK 9, and in all likelihood also on a JDK 8 update, following soon after JDK 9 GA with uh, a similar protocol stack upgrade in a JDK 8 update something, right? Let's not wait for Servlet 4, and in particular not for Servlet 4 containers. Let's make the best possible use of the latest generation of web containers that we already have and uh, embrace HTTP 2 as soon as possible. This is essentially also what we are doing in, well, at Spring Framework level, in particular at Spring Boot level. We support the latest generation, Tomcat 8, 5, JD 9, 4. We always do, even ahead of their release, um, in order to enable you to uh, embrace, in this case, HTTP 2 in a reasonable time frame. And once Servlet 4 editions of those containers are out, the uh, upgrade is going to be very smooth. Fresh installations are going to be easier. Nothing wrong with that, but no need to wait for this, necessarily. All right. Um, HTTP 2 has a little bit more to it, uh, HTTP 2 enabled clients. Uh, but let's, let's summarize this as it's all already available in one form or the other. OK, HTTP, uh, other libraries out there. So everything else basically is already in place. Nothing prevents us from setting up HTTP 2 systems right now. Let's move on to a uh, different topic, right? To the functional perspective. Functional in, um, in our terms is a uh, just general change of perspective and attempt to uh, revisit the setup of a typical Spring application from a more functional perspective. Now, what does functional really mean? Well, um, let's refer back to the state of the art, right? Spring is, per, uh, is, is generally perceived uh, these days as an annotation-based framework uh, with a, a strong, comprehensive annotation-based component model. This is, of course, uh, entirely, an entirely valid perspective, but Spring itself, the framework itself, the core framework in particular, is not actually annotation-based. Um, for, well, for, for many years now, ever since its inception, we considered metadata formats as something uh, uh, on top of the core container, right? Um, we were carefully avoiding uh, any ties to XML initially. We we're carefully avoiding any core ties to annotations in recent years. Um, the core container is very, very flexible. It can be instructed and sourcing metadata from, from different uh, um, sources and can actually combine them, mixing and matching um, the the uh, benefits of this particular architecture in our core container really show through in Spring 5 now. Uh, because from this functional perspective, we intend to provide facilities and refinements, conveniences all over the framework, allowing you to set up an entire Spring-based application without the use of annotations, uh, but with the use of uh, functional features and functional stylistic elements, um, in particular for Java 8, and also for Kotlin, for the Kotlin language. This is, of course, intended as an alternative. The annotation-based model is not going away. We're just um, revisiting the, the, our core container and our core APIs from a different perspective in order to challenge them a little and to provide a common foundation for, for, for both models. 
uh, it's also not for the same kinds of, uh, of projects necessarily. I mean, the annotation-based model with its uh, decentralized pickup of components from the class path, maybe through class path scanning or through uh, some central registration point, uh, this is all fine in particular for larger applications. For more focused, tighter setups, microservices, even if I'm trying to avoid the term, uh, but for, for a, uh, a, a little deployment unit with just a couple of services that need to be combined, uh, the functional style is actually pretty convenient or pretty, pretty compelling, actually. So anyway, uh, let's, let me just hint at, the, at the, uh, 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 this usage model. A generic application context setup is currently the most flexible point already to uh, combine metadata from different sources. You could start with an annotation config application context and combine these things. Mixing and matching between the annotation world and the functional world is a, is a design goal here. But let's, let, let's see what this means. Um, if you just want to register a couple of components referring to each other, you could use the new register bin facilities with a supplier callback. This supplier callback is not just a convenience. It's actually very deep in the core container um, where in order to create a new instance of the given bin, we're going to call the supplier that you're giving to us. And you're not even seeing the suppliers directly here because they're specified as Lambda expressions, right? So uh, those, of course, are Java 8 Lambda expressions where for every bar instance that the, the container needs to create, think about scoped beans, right? Um, the, of, of prototype beans, it's going to call this given supplier here. And the supplier says, okay, I'm, I'm about to create a bar uh, instance here. I need another bean to inject into my bar constructor. And in the most programmatic way possible, it can uh, just uh, grab that bean from the context, use programmatic lookup facilities to obtain other beans. There are plenty already. On the Bean Factory interface, there are going to be even more in the near future, more variants of programmatic lookups. In this kind of arrangement, there is no extra metadata. There are no annotations either. There's, um, in most of those cases, so ex except for this case where there's technically reflection when calling the default constructor, those cases below are even completely, uh, are even completely avoiding reflection. There's no reflection involved in these setups here, right? I mean, the more complex you go, uh, there's going to be some reflection like in, in dynamic proxies in, in, in one form or the other, but not for the actual core container responsibilities, managing the life cycle of freshly constructed instances. So what we can see here below is uh, a, actually a variant with two callbacks. You can customize the Outgo, uh, the, the, the outcome of this registration, the bean defin definition that the container will receive underneath the covers. So if you want to set some flags programmatically, the easiest way to do it is to uh, specify inline bean definition customizers. Again, you're not actually seeing the callback. We're using Java 8 Lambda expressions to uh, receive the callback, to, uh, to express the body of the callback, basically. You get a bean definition, customize it. Set lazy init, add qualifiers, do whatever you need to do um, to get uh, the desired outcome. This is actually a little trick that uh, I'm adding here. If you want to avoid reflection completely, you can uh, pass in a supplier that refers back to the constructor of your bean. Um, the actual runtime dispatching doesn't use reflection then, but it uses a Java 8 method reference, which is a straightforward um, invoke dynamic dispatch to the constructor, no, uh, no, uh, technically uh, completely free of any reflection. So this is uh, basically what we're doing in, in Java 8 style, making good use of Java util function interfaces like the supplier here, um, but in particular of Java 8 language features, lambda expressions, method references, even for bean definition setup. Now in Kotlin, this is even nicer, even more concise. In the Kotlin language, there are a couple of uh, uh, specific benefits baked into the language, even into the callback model, where uh, basically a Kotlin-based lambda expression, uh, we can evaluate it a little bit more clearly. We know what its outcome re uh, return type is. Uh, we have additional reflection facilities available at runtime, and we're making use of those in order to improve the uh, conciseness of the calls. We don't need to repeat the bean type, um, so there are a couple of nice benefits, even in the what we call the Java-style usage of Kotlin, 
Um, basically, a style that is reasonably close to traditional Java um, styles. Whereas what we're seeing here is a variant with the inline uh, type declarations where um, what we call the Gradle style usage, uh, if you've ever looked at the uh, 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 Kotlin API of a Gradle, the, uh, it's, it's exactly equivalent, right? Just a little shorter um, still. And it's kind of an in, inline register being calls uh, against the, uh, the scope of the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the variable uh, in, in, in scope here. So these variants are essentially the same, right? We're talking about the same fundamental mechanisms at the core container level using Java 8 language features um, in hopefully a nice enough way, and in this case uh, using Kotlin language features in uh, nice enough ways. Technically, um, we're actually shipping Kotlin extensions. So in, in the Spring Framework 5 jars, uh, if you look into them, you'll find a couple of uh, KT files. We ship uh, Kotlin extension declarations uh, that the Kotlin compiler picks up, and the Kotlin compiler basically sees over additional overloaded methods on some core Spring API types uh, that you can nicely use here. So we don't have to have those methods in the core APIs. We can add them through the Kotlin extension model for use in Kotlin-based uh, application components, understood by the Kotlin compiler. It's a really nice model. So uh, uh, it's actually quite a pleasure to integrate with an additional language on the, on, on the JVM with such clean extension facilities. All right, there's more to this, but just hinting at where we're going, we're going to revisit this in just a moment because functional registration is also a topic for web endpoints. Web endpoints, right? Um, let's go reactive. In uh, Spring Framework 5, we are introducing a completely new web stack in parallel to the traditional Spring servlet web stack. And we're going to explore this in just a bit. This new web stack takes a very different perspective. It's entirely composed of uh, reactive um, um, processing arrangements, right? A stack that is from the ground up, from ideally from the ground up, from the, the data store level up to the web containers and back down, entirely reactive in its uh, stream interactions. No blocking operations against any I.O. streams, ideally, of course, no blocking operations at all. Um, highly efficient use of not only the I.O. resources, the I.O. stack, on the hardware that you're running on, but also, of course, of the CPU and of uh, the threading resources. So it's essentially about efficient use of our given hardware facilities under high load for a potentially very high number of clients, keeping up certain qualities, even in rather extreme load scenarios, or in maybe, maybe even typical, but high load scenarios, right? The Reactive Manifesto nicely hints at those qualities. Um, the Reactive Manifesto um, is, well, it's essentially just a couple of uh, 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 qualities, right, that we're trying to achieve. Responsiveness, even under high load. Um, predictable behavior, I would argue, right? Predictable behavior under high load. Uh, resiliency in the sense of uh, being able to fail over, being able to handle uh, situations where certain clients kind of uh, trigger operations that, may, that block on their end, not preventing other clients from getting a regular response for very simple requests, right? Basically equal treatment for newly incoming requests, even in high load scenarios. A highly tuned servlet container stack, a highly tuned servlet stack, can be good enough for many scenarios. There's no doubt about this. Um, but in particular, under high load, under more extreme scenarios, it's not going to deliver the predictability uh, that you might want to achieve at that level. The server container model fundamentally uh, makes assumptions, right? It's uh, for any given incoming request, you own a thread for processing this request, and you're not letting go of the thread typically. Uh, until you are done with producing the entire response for that request. If in the meantime you need to wait for a separate data store, well, you block, right? So there's a threading model, uh, usually uh, a server endpoint, a servlet endpoint uh, thread pool with uh, quite a number of threads inside, which is the maximum number of requests you're going to handle in parallel. 
these, this problem kind of disappears in the reactive processing architecture uh, because there's an event loop dispatching certain steps, further steps of processing a request as we are able to process them. There is no owning of a thread there, and there is no scalability limit in, in terms of the thread pool size either. A low number of threads is potentially able to handle a very high, essentially unbounded number of clients. The underlying architecture in the technical stack is called reactive streams, and we've actually heard about this in a lunchtime talk today. The reactive streams is uh, a a set of four types of so interfaces, essentially, um, available on reactivestreams.org. So this is an industry collaboration uh, effort between several players in this space, um, including uh, Pivotal, actually. Uh, we run an open source project called Project Reactor, uh, currently in its Reactor 3 generation, which is a Java 8-based reactive composition library, reactive kernel, basically, uh, entirely reactive streams-based and back pressure enabled from the ground up. Um, reactive streams models an interaction pattern between a publisher and a subscriber uh, with uh, a key feature being this back pressure, essentially flow control between um, a publisher and potentially, potentially a slow subscriber. You don't want to, a publisher to keep publishing if, if the subscriber is not even able to keep up uh, processing it, right? If, uh, you don't need the data store driver to keep sending uh, a large document to you if the uh, networking stack doesn't allow you to push that data fast enough back to the client. You only need it to process it uh, whenever you are able to write um, to the, the actual HTTP response. We don't want to, bu to have uh, buffers growing too large here. We don't want to waste uh, uh, processing time either. And in particular, we don't want to block. The whole non-blocking theme uh, is very essential to the reactive streams arrangement. This is the underlying architecture. You do not typically work at that level. You work with a composition library or with frameworks built on, composition, on reactive uh, composition libraries, on reactive higher level reactive libraries. And Reactor is essentially uh, an alternative to RxJava. So if you know RxJava, think about Reactor as a kind of specialized version of RxJava, a tightened up Java 8 based, reactive streams based version of RxJava. The, the stack arrangement, and we're going to see uh, a bit of source code in just a bit, the stack arrangement actually has Reactor rather low. It's an essential part of our spring-based stack down here in the core reactive HTTP abstractions. Um, the interesting part here is now our approach towards the web framework problem, right? How do, how do we build and ship a web framework on top of a reactive streams architecture? Well, first of all, we need an underlying HTTP foundation, an HTTP server, an HTTP runtime capable of reactive HTTP processing. It turns out that there are quite a few options out there. Tomcat and Chetty, for example, are commonly known as server containers, but in terms of their underlying HTTP architecture, they are actually perfectly suitable, uh, perfectly capable reactive uh, foundations, right? Reactive HTTP stacks. Uh, at the lowest level. Our Spring 5 reactive web stack has adapters underneath the covers for uh, several HTTP servers uh, or the, the facilities of several HTTP containers. We have direct support for Tomcat and Chetty, um, direct support in the sense of using some Server 3.1 async I.O. facilities just because we can at that level, um, just because they're good enough, but also directly integrating with the data buffer models, for, it, uh, for example, because the efficient use of data buffers is very essential to uh, a reactive streams performance. So direct support for Tomcat, direct support for Jetty, which you also could be using as a server container, but you're using it as a, a, as, as a reactive web foundation here. The use of Netty is, of course, very essential on our end. Netty is, is kind of the reference model for a, a modern, extremely sophisticated, extremely capable networking stack. And we support Netty, we embrace Netty, uh, actually in two ways. You can even use the Reactor Netty and the RxNetty HTTP stack on top uh, as a choice between the two. 
And we also support Undertow. Um, Undertow is the HTTP container underneath Wildfly. Uh, we're actually not supporting it at the servlet level. Undertow has a core distribution where there is no servlet support, and we operate directly against the underlying Undertow facilities. All of those options pr provide the qualities that we need to have a reactive HTTP stack on top. And um, the web framework that we uh, provide um, actually has a new name, only, only for a few days officially announced. It's called Spring Web Flux. This is essentially what Spring Web MVC is for the servlet stack. Think about those as two aligned but distinct web frameworks with distinct qualities. Spring MVC remains, Spring Web MVC remains as the servlet API based framework that you may already be using, that you may want to keep using, maybe on Servlet 4, with all the integration points, all the Servlet-based SPIs, uh, everything else that you possibly need, right? It doesn't really change. Technically, it's a little refactored. There are some common code reused and some alignment done, but in the grand picture, it essentially remains uh, a straightforward, very backwards compatible upgrade path uh, for Servlet-based stacks typically consumed at the programming model level through the annotation-based model. Control those request mappings or the get mappings and post mappings now. Um, this is the typical, actually not the only, but the typical way of using the servlet stack. We have a variant of this for the web flux stack as well, for the reactive stack. You can use a similar endpoint model, and we're going to see this in just a moment, a similar endpoint model on the reactive stack. Annotation-based components, designed to work on the reactive stack. This is not an abstraction. It's just a similarly structured, similarly designed component model. We're going to see this in just a bit. Alternatively, there's also a functional way of interacting with the reactive web stack. That's best explained in a, in a piece of source code. So look at, let's look at this controller. It's essentially, stylistically, uh, a spring-style controller, very obviously. If you look more closely, you see that the signatures are not quite traditional Spring MVC signatures. We're reusing the same structural uh, arrangement. We have the control annotation. We have the same mapping annotations, the same path variable annotations. You could also use request header and uh, cookie value and all those other annotations. So it's reusing basically the, uh, the uh, HTTP modeling that Spring MVC provides. But it's running on the reactive stack. And in a reactive stack, such handler methods, such mapping uh, methods, are not triggered in order to fully process a request, like in the servlet stack. They are actually called in order to return a processing pipeline for the given request. So they are not meant to actually produce the response. The framework expects a Reactive Streams publisher back, which is able to produce the response once actually called, once actually a subscriber registers and asks uh, for the uh, corresponding data to be produced. So let's assume there's a reactive repository underneath. We actually have Spring Data K. We have a dedicated project providing a repository model for reactive data store drivers. A reactive data store driver in an ideal world delivers already a compatible outcome. We call find by ID. The reactive driver says, here is a Reactive Streams publisher that's capable of retrieving the object that you asked for once, we actually, once you're actually able to consume it. Reactive Streams publishers are usually not um, used directly. We uh, tend to use, already in the industry out there, reactive API types, which are reactive publishers. So what we see as a mono in the flux technically is implementing the Reactive Streams publisher interface. But those are reactor types, reactor API types, uh, modeling the outcome uh, at a bit of a higher level and allowing composition of different uh, uh, processing pipelines. This is essentially, from an RxJava perspective, uh, a flux is an observable. And mono is basically single and completable combined. So uh, quite literally, you can actually declare RxJava's observable here and RxJava single here. If you happen to have a, a data store driver or a repository implementation, returning RxJava uh, Rx publishes to you, just pass them through to the framework, to the web framework. Our web framework in Spring 5 naturally understands RxJava types, both RxJava 1 and RxJava 2 types. 
We internally use Reactor, and we tend to recommend the use of Reactor types uh, in application components as well, because they are just uh, tightened up uh, with a smaller surface. In Reactor, there's only Flux, representing a stream of uh, a whole sequence of objects, basically um, a list of users, right? Just in a, in, a, in a reactive fashion. And mono represents a single or none, a little bit like Java util optional. Again, as a reactive processing pipeline, which can be used for composition. It has uh, map, flat map, and further operations on it, just like in RxJava. There's actually very close alignment between the reactor types and the RxJava 2 types. That's not coincidental. Um, there's actually a very strong relationship with the RxJava team. The uh, RxJava 2 maintainer, David Carnock, is a uh, committer on Reactor. And I'm quoting David. If you're on Java 8 and building server-side applications, use Reactor 3 and not RxJava 2. Because Reactor 3 is designed for those purposes. A smaller, more focused, and easier to grasp to some degree library, less extensive in its API surface. Uh, whereas RxJava has to... Um, um, appeal to very different stakeholders, has to run on Android, uh, has a bit of legacy, needs to have compatible types for the RxJava 1 types and the parallel back pressure enabled hierarchy. So if you're wondering why RxJava 2 has both observable and flowable, the best explanation is the historical perspective, uh, whereas Reactor has the benefit of late birth, essentially. It came at a time when Java 8 was already an ideal foundation and it was able to learn lessons from from uh, ArxJava already. In terms of the operators, the composition operators, there is a, a strong alignment. So most of the operators have the same name and the same style between ArxJava 2 and Reactor. This is very, very intentional. And actually, to some degree, uh, David's work. Or uh, the work between David and our Reactor lead, Stefan Maldini. All right, so this is basically, in an ideal world, you just reach down a layer, already get a reactive type, and pass it through. Of course, you can also use the Flux and Mono APIs directly to build any kind of composition chain of processing pipeline and return it from here. Let's, let's uh, stay at the programming model level for a moment and at the same time see a slightly different composition style. So this is the annotation-based variant. Mapping, mappings on methods, handler methods, but the handler methods don't process the request. They return a processing pipeline for the given request. A slightly, actually quite different arrangement, right? The, the router functions that I hinted at before. In this model, we have uh, the same underlying web architecture, the same stack. But instead of using annotations or of using the add controller model, we approach things from a different perspective. We build router functions and handler functions. A, what we name a router here is essentially just a composed router function where we say like for this, an incoming request for this predicate, delegate to this handler function. For this other predicate, delegate to the other handler function. So you can of course imagine a dozen such mappings. In this case, using Java 8 method references to dispatch to specific delegate methods, right? And what we see down here, is a sketch for those delegate methods on a delegate class. So let's assume the repository has been injected here or given here in some form. The delegate methods do not use the annotation-based model, right? Not the flexible signature model from annotations. They are actually bound um, to the handler function interface. So this syntax here is Java 8, a Java 8 method reference, which means the handler function interface accepted here needs to be mirrored in this signature. Handler function has a, has a request coming in and you're supposed to build a processing pipeline for the response and return it. So, so it's, it's slightly lower level, but just slightly, than the annotation-based model. But you can actually see what's happening here, right? This is, you're being called back to answer, in this case, with a mono of server response, a building ins instruction for a server response. You can't declare an argument of, with add path variable here. So you have to take the request and programmatically ask for the path variable. There are several ways of doing this, but essentially here you're taking the path variable, building a processing pipeline where you're saying, take this variable, convert it to a long, and pass it to the find by ID method of this repository here. And then we're building the server response. There's a builder API on the server response. We are passing in this publisher here. So the, this uh, processing pipeline, this mono, 
into the server response and saying, here's a, basically a couple of instructions for the server response in general, and uh, please take the body from this processing pipeline that I have here. For simpler scenarios where there are no incoming parameters, right, like a uh, find all method, you reach down to the repository, you get flux or, or observable back, and you build a server response using the builder API, passing this, uh, this stream of users in as uh, the body to expose. These methods execute very quickly. The whole point is that they are being called from a, an event loop, quickly building their pipelines, returning them to the event loop, and leaving it up to the runtime system, to the runtime processing architecture, to register subscribers and request the next element to process whenever the runtime is ready for it. You never block, you just build a processing pipeline, leave it up to the runtime to call it back at the right time. This is, of course, very, very different from a traditional servlet processing architecture. Such a repository will have to be using a, a reactive data store driver. And there are quite a few of them out there for Mongo, for Couchbase. Um, if you're trying to use traditional transactions against relational databases, you're out of luck in this particular arrangement. Such operations can be integrated into such an architecture, but only in the form of worker pools, not triggered here from a handler method. It's a little bit like in UI programming, right? In Swing UI programming or any other UI programming. If you're triggering a blocking operation here, you're basically blocking the rendering thread, right? Like in an UI architecture. You should not be doing this, right? So th these are really meant to build processing pipelines. If there's any more extensive work to be done that can't be expressed in a reactive processing pipeline, consider delegation to a worker thread and building a, a mono or a flux from the outcome of that worker thread in a separate worker thread pool. Let's stay once more at the programming model level, actually a very trivial refactoring. Between those two variants, we're just using a different Java style. It's a, the exact same API. We just choose to not have a delegate. We choose to inline the handler functions as Lambda expressions. So we build a router function, we're saying this predicate here, Here's the handler function. Request comes in. Let's build a server response for it. And if the operations, the, the, pipeline, the pipeline arrangement, pipeline building is simple enough, you can just use a Lambda expression to nest it. I mean, for, it's, it's perfectly okay for two routes, right? It may be okay for a five or six, but uh, at some point, this is probably the nice uh, arrangement, right, where you separate the routing information with a whole uh, series of uh, delegates that do the actual processing. It's up to you. The um, API arrangement allows for, for both styles, of course. All right. Um, uh, this is basically stylistically what we're doing. And you can see that the uh, uh, functional nature actually really, really shines through here. Right? We really mean it for the endpoint model because as an alternative, we have the annotation-based variant. So choosing between the two, those are rather, rather different arrangements, but basically expressing the same, the same runtime characteristics, interacting with the same runtime stack. Uh, it's your choice what you prefer to use here. You could, of course, also have some more complex uh, building code in here. So the, the underlying facilities are all the same. Even mixing and matching um, is entirely possible here. The uh, Spring Boot support for the reactive web starters uh, is also giving an easy entry to these, to these models, in particular uh, to the annotation-based dispatcher uh, on, a, on your choice of reactive stack underneath. So to wrap up, and already wrapping up also this boot tent, what we're delivering in Spring Framework 5.0 with the RC1 plan for April is... Um, well, what, what I've been talking about today, plus a lot of other things that I, I didn't have the time to talk about, right? Uh, everything I talked about today is actually already in 5.0 M5, released uh, a couple of days ago. So, um, JDK baselining, even early support for JDK 9 and the servlet 4 API. So you can even already inject servlet 4 push builders if you really need the feature. Uh, we have the functional story, at least in its initial incarnation and the reactive web endpoint model, plus the underlying reactive HTTP um, infrastructure, plus the reactive, HTT the reactive codec abstraction that we have underneath, so a lot of foundational facilities underneath. All of this is going to come your way in Spring Framework 5.0. Of course, in parallel to the 
Shivlet stack, right? Remember, Spring Web MVC, Spring Web Flux, co-evolving, nicely aligned, but available as separate options in a Spring Framework 5.0 side by side. There's more coming. Um, we have more ideas that we can't roll into this timeline. We see Spring Framework 5.0 as the beginning of a generation of the framework, at the 5.x generation. There are going to be 5.1, 5.2 releases completing these, this vision, these, uh, these trends, right? adding further variants for the functional style support, uh, certainly further capabilities to the reactive web architecture, uh, further exploration of uh, what we can do on JDK 9, and so forth. So, so see it as the beginning, but a production level beginning of a new generation of the framework. I've already hinted at Spring Data K. Um, since repository interaction is a central problem, you, you of course, are free to use anything right, that you uh, choose to, to expose there. Uh, uh, it can code directly uh, against any data store driver that allows you to build a reactive processing pipeline from it. And fortunately, there are already many initiatives out there. And most of them, in their latest incarnation, are reactive streams-based, so can very nicely be adapted into RxJava 2 or into Reactor. At the same time, we have a new revision of our Spring Data portfolio. Spring Data, the next Spring Data release training named K, uh, has a strong reactive repository model, uh, a strong focus on a reactive repository model with out-of-the-box support for Mongo, Cassandra, for, for Redis, uh, in all likelihood, uh, for, for Couchbase, depending on the availability of the underlying drivers. This is a problem we cannot solve on our own, and we're completely aware of this. We're trying to, uh, uh, to motivate other stakeholders in the industry uh, to, to do their part, to ship reactive streams-based drivers that we can nicely integrate into a spring-based reactive web stack. So to some degree, we have to wait for those efforts to, uh, to happen first, but we can, of course, also add a little motivation by sharing our roadmap and suggesting that it would be really nice if things happened in time. And Spring Boot to the Dough is going to wrap this up. Um, Spring Boot to the Dough has already snapshots. If you're going to start with Spring.io and you're using the Spring Web Reactive Starter, you currently get a Spring Boot to the Dough snapshot with uh, the latest Spring Framework 5.0 milestone. This is uh, a fine start to experiment, but of course, we really need to enter the milestone phase. So along with the Spring Framework 5.0 RC1 release, there will be a Spring Boot to the Dough M1 release. Uh, the actual release candidate phase will uh, uh, happen later this year. Uh, GA is expected for uh, more towards the uh, uh, Q4 timeframe, November timeframe this year. Boot to the Do, of course, builds on Spring Framework 5, builds on Spring Data K, builds on new versions of Spring Security and Spring Integration with uh, reactive support in those as well. And it also provides dependency management, you know, a central feature in Boot to the Do and in the IO platform. Dependency management also for reactive web stacks, which is not an entirely trivial topic at the moment, but there is still some, um, some, some time um, where we hope that uh, a couple of currently beta releases actually ship in production form so that we can pick them up for our dependency management. All right, this is basically the, the story, um, the uh, strategic perspective on what's happening in, in Springland in 2017. Uh, we typically... Uh, already have a plan beyond, but uh, uh, first of all, let's, we, are, we are very committed to delivering um, Spring from Mac 5.0 and uh, Spring Boot 2.0, and then we're going to take it from there, essentially. The, uh, uh, the time for feedback is ideal now, right? If you're going to try the reactive web start, if you're going to experiment with the reactive web stack or with the functional features, or if you're trying to run uh, on Jigsaw on JDK 9, give it a try now. Things are in a fine enough shape uh, to be tried, uh, and we can still incorporate the feedback even ahead of the release candidate phase. Uh, but even afterwards, we're very willing to consider uh, real-life feedback, real-life requirements, and kind of feed them into at least the Spring Framework 5.1 plan. Um, this is an, an evolving framework. It evolves with the industry, with the ecosystem. Uh, it's an offering for you uh, to, to adopt uh, basically to opt into this evolution, not just taking Spring Framework 5 to though, but also looking forward um, to uh, what's happening afterwards, what's enabled by Spring Framework 5 to though for years to come. All right, thanks for your attention. Uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them.